Uh, this is a uh, welcome to this session, uh, Why Literature, Why Compare, and Why It Matters. This is the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Nicole Huang. I'm the chairperson of this department. I'm joined by three of my wonderful colleagues, uh, Dr. Fiona Law um, and Dr. Alvin Wong and Dr. Daniel Elam are joining me. So there are four of us here from the Department of Comparative Literature. And you look at the four of us, uh, I believe we represent very well uh, what the department is and what the department does. So uh, let me just begin with myself. I am a scholar of literature and visual culture. I work on Chinese and Sinophone literature. I work on uh, visual culture and film, uh, film as part of visual culture. I teach a variety of courses. I also teach literary theory. Uh, my colleague, uh, Alvin, Alvin Wong, Dr. Alvin Wong, uh, he works on Hong Kong literature and culture. Uh, Sinophone and Chinese literature as well. He also works on gender and queer studies. Uh, he also does research in environmental humanities. Dr. Daniel Yilam here, uh, he works on Asian and African literature, post-colonial theories and modernism. Uh, he uh, recently has been working on anti-colonial movements of the British empire. And Fiona Law, Dr. Law, uh, he also works on Hong Kong cinema and culture and visual cultures. And you might be very interested in, to learn that he, uh, she uh, works on animal studies, animal rights and post-humanism. So you can see that the four of us uh, represent a pretty broad, uh, diverse uh, background, but somehow all come together. We have come together uh, to make this program that we call comparative literature. Comparative literature at the University of Hong Kong has been a, quite a popular major. It has been and it continues to be. And I have very good reasons to believe that will continue uh, to be a popular major. Uh, so let's unpack the title, Why Literature, Why Compare? and why it matters. Uh, we will begin with uh, uh, Dr. Wong, Alvin Wong. Uh, speak to us uh, about uh, why literature why compare. Please, Dr. Wong. Well, um, um, in terms of um, my part, I would talk about um, why literature a little bit more. And, um, the question of why literature uh, brings with it a set of related set of questions of what defines literature. If we define literature by genre and form, literature might include the epic, poetry, play, novel, tragedy, comedy, folklore, and so, so on and so forth. But if we take a step further, moving from the form of literature to the social and ideological functions of literature, the implication is far reaching. The literary theorist Jonathan Cutler defines literature as, quote, a speech act or textual event that elicits certain kinds of attentions. To give you um, an everyday example, uh, if a writer wants to convey a feeling of romance in a novel or poem, writing the expression, I love you on a page simply won't do the trick. Literature then is the textuality that gives the idea of I love you on a, uh, uh, a form of literariness. So we have the speaker, for example, in Shakespeare's uh, Sonnet 18, contemplating the warmness and eternity of love through such lines as, shall I compare thee to a summer day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. The romantic poems William Blake may have a slightly different idea on the subject of love, preferring to symbolize love and youth as the red rose that may not withstand the test of time in his classic poem, The Sick Rose. 
A literary work uses figurative language so as to render literature different from other kinds of writing. The effect of that is what some scholars call defamiliarization, which produces the aha moments in readers and makes us look at the world differently. Um, the other obvious aspect of literature is its inherent fictionality. While most novels, films, and cultural texts refer to historical settings, such as the transition from Lei Qing to Republican China in Lu Xun's uh, The Story of Ah Qiu uh, Zeng Jun, or the haunting legacy of slavery in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, what literature performs is what some theorists like Derrida and others have called uh, supplementarity which refers to history and reality often defamiliarizes, overflows, and surprises. For example, in Lu Xun's The Story of Ah Qiu, The True Story of Ah Qiu, the powerlessness of the protagonist is embodied by Ah Qiu, uh, his spirit of I win even when I lose mentality, and most powerfully captured by his inability to even sign his own name during the interrogation scene. In Eileen Chen's um, Love in a Fallen City, the fall of Hong Kong under Japanese occupation is contrast with the protagonist uh, Bai Liu Su's uh, endurance in the game of love as a fallen woman from Shanghai. What these classics from world literature review is the supplementary and surprising qualities of literature, namely its opacity, its complexity, it's, and of course, its ability to tell minor and alternative stories often buried under the monumental weight of history. So I'll just very quickly transition to talk a little bit about why compare. So isn't reading literature and watching films from our own national and regional contests enough? Why do we compare? And how is, com this is the promotional part, how is comparative literature different from or even better than the study of English literature? A pragmatic answer would be, as we are becoming more and more connected under the force of globalization and mediated by advances in technology and communications, we are by default becoming global readers and cultural consumers. Thus, as cultural critics and viewers, we are as likely to watch films from Hollywood, Bollywood, South Korea, Japan, and those made in Hong Kong. Just to give you some example, uh, and also an area that I teach and work on, um, a film viewer with an interest in LGBT and queer cinema might enjoy watching films like Moonlight, uh, Call Me By Your Name, Happy Together, The Danish Girl, as well as those from queer Sinophone cinema, such as Formula 17, uh, Tracy, um, Choi Si, and so, so, so the, the two uh, very uh, recently very well acclaimed films from Hong Kong. And of course, the list goes on. From the more intellectual perspective, I will borrow Susan Basnett's definition. Comparative literature involves the study of texts across cultures, that it is interdisciplinary and it is concerned with patterns of connection in literatures across both time and space. Comparative literature at HKU takes, I would argue, take this um, uh, classic definition even further to the point that literature is necessarily a critical act always in motion. Our teachers encourage students to study literature across genres, historical periods, and cultural forms. The desire to compare them is at once personal, political, and global. And I invite all of you to explore more with us by becoming a complete major. So that's part, and I'll stop here and turn over to my colleague, Janet Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. So we continue with Dr. Elon. Continue to speak about why literature, why compare, please. So uh, I thought I. I thought about the question, uh, why compare? And I, I really love uh, Professor Wang's um, answer that, it, that here at HKU, we do, uh, a, what we do is a critical act in motion. And that is that, that both refers to comparing and also to the literature that we choose. And 
like Professor Huang mentioned, I study um, anti-colonial writing from uh, India and Pakistan in the 1920s and in, in a field that it's called post-colonial studies. And one of the things that I think a lot of the people who work in post-colonial studies believe is that when we say that two things can be compared, it's not simply that we can put them side by side and you know say call it a day. But we're actually saying something uh, that is much more powerful is that to, to say that two things can be compared means that they're equal and uh, they have an equality, uh, which is the exact opposite of the logics that like British, the British Empire and the French Empire had. And so um, for post-colonial studies, for post-colonial scholars like me, me, to compare literature means to say that the literature around the world, so texts like books, novels, films, um, political manifestos, all of these things exist in a world that is sharing a, con a conversation um, about a world that it, we live in, a world that we want to live in, um, and, it's, and it's part of this shared global conversation and that we can participate, um, like, uh, um, like Alvin just said, in this kind of critical act in motion. And that's really what's exciting about um, this, this provocation, either this kind of um, the, the demand to compare literature as opposed to um, maybe just allowing it to exist. Uh, the, it's a, the, the comparative and comparative literature is an active verb. Uh, and, and so it means to, you know, to really get your hands dirty in, in the muck of thinking about the ways that texts and film and all, all sorts of different cultural objects are speaking to each other and tell us about, um, and, and tell us about the world and tell us about the world that we could be in, uh, imagine new worlds, describe old worlds that uh, we, we haven't, we have, we have lost like, uh, like in Beloved, uh, or describe new worlds, uh, like something like Octavia Butler's Kindred, all of these things um, are, um, are what we mean when we say compare, is to, is to jump into the muck of literature and, and imagine the world with it. Thank you so much. I really like that. I mean, the, the motion, the active motion, the comparative literature is about to literature and to compare, right? So it is the, the, the act to be engaged, uh, to engage with the moment, engage with the text, engage with the images. So that very much captures the spirit uh, of the work that we do. So we then move on to uh, Dr. Fiona Law. I trust that she has many uh, good uh, stories to share about why literature, why compare, why it matters, it matters. So please. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, thank you, um, Elvin and uh, Daniel in sharing your thoughts. Let me share my screen here. So uh, yeah, third question, why it matters? Um, well, it looks like the most difficult question, but actually uh, I would say the answer is quite simple. Um, it does matter because understanding other cultures and otherness in general is an important process of understanding oneself and finding out how we do not understand ourselves through making connections, venturing to how these connections takes place in the world we're living, analyzing and imagining how we handle these cultural issues at present and in future. So actually I would say this is a mind broadening, border crossing process that defines the importance of humanities and arts education. So um, cultural studies scholars, uh, Lawrence Grosbert, uh, Grosbert actually mentions, uh, it's a long quotation, but I want to focus on the middle part of the citation. He said that uh, cultural studies matters because it is about the future, about some of the work it will take in the present to shape the future. It is about understanding the present in the surface of the future. So. Um, well, and in explaining to you uh, why it matters to study comparative literature, I would like to introduce the internship program in department uh, for our major students as the capstone experience in the third and fourth year and um, kind of explain to you how the present work of the students is uh, in the surface of the future. So uh, instead of giving you a general introduction of how the internship program runs, which should be something that you can conveniently find on our website. Let me try to explain the meaning of internship in a comparative literature manner, if there is such an approach. Uh, we can start with the root meaning of the word internship, uh, which is a rather popular word now being used among university students and being found in an increasing number of undergraduate programs around the world. 
The etymology of internship comes from the two sessions internship. So the word intern, as we understand nowadays, does not exist until quite lately in human history. And therefore, and before that, the word intern simply means internal, inner, within, or confined within set limits. The idea of internship as professional workplace training only occurred until um, since early 20th century for medical students to exercise their skill set and situate themselves in real environments. So um, under super, uh, actually under professional supervision as well. So this is also how we usually understand internship as related to specific professional disciplines like medical practice, dentistry, legal studies, engineering, architecture, and so on. So these are the disciplines in which students are trained to become professional people under specific frameworks. And it also explains why internship is related to the ideas of inner, inward, and internal, because students are put within a workplace environment in order to get used to a regulated setting and learn to be disciplined in a professional manner. In this regard, uh, it is understandable as well as difficult for people to understand how and why students from arts and humanities can be related to professional trainings because we have this general assumption that our studies are not about learning practical skills and acquiring professional qualifications. And of course, it is actually with this assumption that explains why internship is needed because the practical experience in internship will successfully prepare our students to find jobs much easier after graduation, which is uh, realistically very true to our comparative literature students throughout the years. Um, however, uh, internship for comparative literature students is more than simply situating themselves within a workplace environment, but I would say probably quite the opposite of it or reverting that idea as we are actually kicking our students out of their comfort zone or the classroom or all the theories and knowledge they have gained in our courses and to explore a learning through unlearning experience that is both self-initiated and unthought of. In our assessment of students' performance in the internship program, we see the self-reflection and self-assessment as very crucial because students are encouraged to think and act beyond the set limits, and they are learning also how to be more adaptable and flexible in the global development of the world. So internship in uh, comparative literature and cultural studies is, I would say, a border crossing learning experience where students are gaining insights in understanding themselves, both in a cultural, uh, both as a cultural practitioner in training, finding themselves uh, a method to bridge between academic knowledge and workplace environments, and seeing themselves as crossing the invisible borders they may have in their minds regarding their current studies and visions about future career. Different from the conventional idea of internship as confining the trainees within the professional framework, our internship offer opportunities for students to explore the unknown, make sense of the world, and find out a clearer vision about what they want to do next through hands-on working experience as learning experience. So this may sound a bit abstract, so let me show you some of our students sharing of what they did during their internship here. So uh, this is actually a collage of several presentations by some of our students who finished their internship uh, in the previous years. So as you see, they worked in a variety of organizations such as NGOs like AIDS Concern, art related ones like Asia Art Archive and uh, cultural event organizers like Hong Kong International Photo Festival and Hong Kong International Literary Festivals, etc. So in their presentations, students are asked to introduce what these organizations do, what kind of cultural impacts these organizations have and how these organizations make the conversation with the academic knowledge they already acquired in our courses. So before the internship begin, we ask our students to create their own learning objectives and design the learning outcomes and work with the intern supervisors about how to achieve these objectives through various tasks and duties in these organizations. Um, as each has their own expectations and goals uh, very uniquely, this self-made tailor-made planning of their own learning experience is also something very different from classroom learning. So uh, here you can see different types of works these students had completed from basic editorial duties like uh, writing short pieces of film reviews for social media, doing translations and transcriptions for uh, subtitles uh, in movies and other publicity materials, arranging and conducting interviews with artists, writers, filmmakers, conducting research about uh, public policies, helping with grant proposal writing, community outreach, and uh, even participating 
working in different stages and responsibilities in cultural curatorship. So it's a lot. Um, this student who worked in Hong Kong International Photo Festival at the beginning of this year actually had a has acquired important skills of being flexible, adaptable, and becoming a really engaging team player uh, when exhibitions and cultural activities were undergoing extreme challenges under COVID-19. So actually, both the students and the host organizations learn to react creatively and flexibly when the uncertain situation is impacting everyone's life and work. And speaking of creativity, some of our students also have explored their unprecedented and thought of talents in making visual works and function that function to engage with the public. Um, you can see the creative works such as WhatsApp stickers and infographics. So probably some of you may come across with these um, things and images um, uh, somewhere uh, in society as well. And uh, as well as uh, short videos that introduce films in a way that is also informative. So these students try to include and combine the film knowledge uh, they learned from our courses and apply them in these videos and reach out to the general public. So our host organizations are also very supportive to our student interns and see their creative and critical input as important contributions to the growth of these organizations too, especially for those uh, NGO who are um, in the very early stage of development. Um, so our internships uh, inputs are very uh, important to them as well. Um, so in the end, our students find themselves becoming very different people after they have experienced the cultural shock at workplace. So these are some of the points that they uh, told me about what they have learned and what they didn't think of before uh, doing internship is something that they can make connections to um, compared to literature studies as well. Especially disappointment and failures, they actually find new things about uh, through all these uh, failures and disappointments and, and challenges to their own expectations too. Um, so these are the slides uh, showing what they have learned and how they concluded their internship experience and uh, the kind of insights that they gained in rethinking their initial assumptions about cultural issues like, for example, gender and sex education and how they get reminded of what they wanted to do with film studies before they started the undergraduate studies. So they uh, reflect upon what they wanted to do at the beginning uh, uh, as they entered Hong Kong U and in their senior year, this is the moment in which they think about uh, their original uh, aspiration as well. So uh, finally, when the world has recovered from the pandemic situation, so hopefully in near future, so we will also resume our overseas internship that takes place in summer semester. So the GLOCAL project is one of its kind in HKU as well as international tertiary education as it draws on an interdisciplinary collaboration between Faculty of Social Sciences, um, Department of Civil Engineering and Department of Comparative Literature. It's also a very unthought of collaboration, but it works uh, for years already. So students from these uh, different disciplines will receive trainings together and work together um, in a project led by international NGO. So uh, in this is a, a picture taken in 2019 uh, when uh, World Vision initiated this project in Vietnam and uh, had our students working together um, for a period of two months in building a swimming pond, okay, and uh, advocating child injury prevention to local community there. So our students' um, imagination, uh, creative power, and their power of storytelling, their knowledge in narratology, film studies, visual cultures, etc., are very useful in uh, putting these um, important issues into practice and uh, to the general public. And uh, finally, so you can find all the basic information about our internship program uh, on our departmental website. And I look forward to seeing you as our student interns and join this adventure with us very soon. So I guess that's all. Thank you so much, Dr. Law. Uh, this is our signature internship program that Dr. Law has coordinated in the past years. And this is actually um, many of the students participated and thinking this is a really wonderful way uh, to cap 
uh, the four years of uh, studies at HKU. And despite the pandemic, the program actually is still going on and going strongly. Uh, so we, uh, let me share, uh, I would like to uh, share the department webpage. Uh, this is a webpage. Um, I just want to quickly navigate this page. Uh, with you and you can see that you could find people and all of us here are uh, specialty and what we do, what we teach uh, uh, listed here and there's a uh, undergraduate and under the undergraduate cap or the courses are listed. So you could have a full view of what we're offering uh, different levels of UG courses. Uh, postgraduate, this is our MA program, MALCS and this CSGC is the Center for Studies of Globalizations and Culture housed within the department. All of our events are here. And despite the pandemic, we still have many events going on. So if you're interested about what the department does and uh, what the uh, teaching staff are actively researching in, and this is a good place to find out. And I really wanna show you is the Friends of Complete, this tab, Friends of Complete. And we actually been still building on, we're still building on uh, this archive of alumni. Uh, you can see, you could scroll down and see the fields, professions, different disciplines that our graduates have gone into. We have the novelist Dong Kai Zhang among one of our um, famous, uh, well-known uh, graduates. Uh, we have younger generations, several generations of graduates uh, who have left the program uh, and gone on to different professions and very active in cultural uh, industry, uh, in all kinds of professions and internship program uh, paved the way uh, to bring the knowledge to to realize this knowledge in real life situations. So I'm really hoping as we're wrapping up, uh, wrapping up the session that we could find many of you uh, in fall 2021 in our classes. And uh, in due course, you would be a community of the Friends of Complet. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. And just one last thing, the session is recorded. Uh, the session is recorded, so uh, we will post this right afterwards on our webpage, on Complete's webpage. Also, we are on Facebook. Please friend us. Uh, the video will be posted, and feel free to share with a friend uh, who might not be able to uh, come to the session and also review the session yourself uh, if you're, you know, you want to learn about more. So thank you so much from all of us here and uh, enjoy the info day. Enjoy the virtual info day. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Okay, bye-bye.